Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Gaurav Dalmia, the president of Dalmia Group Holdings, which has holdings in business and financial assets. And I'm also with Jayant Sinha, a member of the parliament and the chairman of the Standing Committee on Finance in the Indian Parliament. Gentlemen, thanks for being with me today. Thank you for having us, Rob. Thank you, Rob. We, we uh, obviously are making this podcast here in April of 2020, where everybody is consumed by the consequences and the, the powerful response that is necessary to the pandemic that's called COVID-19. Each of you, I'll, I'll start with Jayant, but I'm going to ask the same question of each of you. What are we learning as you observe the responses around the world? How, uh, how does it, what has been revealed in the presence of the pandemic suggests that we've somehow been off course in our social and system design? And what, what do you see around the world that is inspiring, that has the how we say, potential to help us stabilize and have a prosperous future. Jayant, please. Thank you very much, Rob, again, for uh, having us. And uh, you started off this discussion with a very profound and thought-provoking question. Uh, because what uh, this uh, corona pandemic is showing uh, is that we are uh, singularly unprepared uh, for uh, black swan events, uh, let alone a mega black swan event, which is what uh, the corona pandemic is. Uh, the sad truth is that, you know, uh, thinkers, thought leaders have been preparing us and warning us about a pandemic like this for a long time. Uh, but when it came, we were absolutely unprepared to deal with it. Uh, and it really uh, demonstrates uh, that uh, we just don't have the systems uh, and we don't have uh, the uh, uh, the multilateral institutions that will enable us to deal with that. So that is very clear that we are unprepared uh, globally and uh, at the country level in dealing with these uh, mega and uh, you know very serious black swan events. So that's I think the first learning. The second learning is that when you know these uh, kinds of uh, catastrophes come upon us, uh, the global response, uh, the global cooperation. Uh, does not really uh, engender much confidence. Uh, and apart from a great deal of bickering and finger pointing, uh, we do not really see a coordinated response, uh, which is really necessary for something uh, of, of this sort. Uh, and of course, that extracts uh, just uh, uh, untold human, uh, human costs. Uh, so that's very clearly uh, happening as well. The third thing I will say uh, is that at the country level, uh, and certainly in India, we have demonstrated that as well, uh, that there has been a range of responses, uh, some of which have been excellent. And I would really put India's uh, handling of the whole matter in that category of being very excellent, being very preemptive and getting ahead of the curve, if you will. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and, and, and that's really what we are seeing happening across the world is each country is dealing with it in its own ways, given its own societies, given its own mores uh, and its own state capacity. Uh, and there's a lot to be learned from all these different experiences. But at the end of all of that, uh, if we were to just step back and say, uh, where are we right now? I would say that we are still in a, a very, very serious situation. Uh, we've done really, really well in India. Uh, but nonetheless, we've gone from uh, you know, a situation where cases were doubling three of, every three or four days to doubling every 10 days. Uh, but even doubling every 10 days is a very, very catastrophic situation. We have at least six months before uh, any cures will be available. Uh, and uh, in 180 days, uh, you know, if this continues to double every 10 days, we will still be uh, in, a, in, a, in a very catastrophic situation. So uh, that's, that's kind of what we are seeing right now. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, you know, the, the quicker science can get us a solution, uh, the better off we are going to be. Gaurav, your thoughts? Rob, um, I would echo similar thoughts, I would say. One, I would say is because we've been immensely successful as a society, a global society, 
we've kind of not thought through long tail risks. And today we are facing one of those. Uh, it's made us somewhat uh, uh, complacent. We are overconfident of technology. We are overconfident that people will solve problems, which in the long term is true. But I think in the near to medium term, often we find that challenges overwhelm us. And therefore, I think we need to balance that confidence with a little bit of humility. A second point I would make is the same forces that have made us strong, the global interlinkages, which has made us prosperous and strong as a society. It's the same globalization, which is somehow weakening us at this point in terms of the pandemic spreading from one place to the other and so on and so forth. And therefore, we need to understand that every strength at a certain point can become a weakness. Thirdly, I would say that typically we tend to focus on top-down views of uh, governance. But if you look at some of the success stories in India, particularly in the state of Kerala here and there, uh, I would say that the bottoms up approach to governance has actually worked very well as well. And we don't emphasize that often enough. So I would emphasize that. Fourth, I would say, you know, Francis Fukuyama wrote this book called Trust, which spoke about how societies that have innate trust actually tend to do better than societies that don't. And this is a time where all of us need to come together, whether we are businesses, government, NGOs, uh, retailers, we have to come together to solve problems if not, and not just leave it to health professionals to solve the problem. And I think this is one of those tests we need to pass. And lastly, I would say, you know, there's this feeling amongst people that someone else will solve the problem. And that I believe that mindset is wrong. There is no someone else to solve the problem, whether it's climate change or the pandemic or anything else is for us individually to see how we might act. And we need to have a sense of agency about that. How uh, do each of you see the challenge being somewhat different or greater in emerging countries? I, my, my own intuition is that there is what you might call relatively mature infrastructure in many of the advanced countries and now the fiscal burden of dealing with something that's this disruptive to the supply side and requires a lot of action, fiscal action by the government, I, I, would, I would guess that it's very stressful because that fiscal capacity could have been used for many other things that would facilitate development and, and moving up uh, the pro in terms of prosperity for your entire society. Is it harder in an emerging country now? Is it demoralizing? Is it setting people back? How does it differ between there and, say, the G10 countries? So, Rob, I think the recovery in uh, the developing world is going to be uh, much slower than it would be in the developed world. Uh, and there are a number of factors that drive that. Uh, number one, of course, uh, the health infrastructure is much weaker, so the impact will be larger in terms of the pandemic. Uh, secondly, uh, as you pointed out, far more limited fiscal resources, uh, and therefore, you know, the ability to stimulate the economy or uh, deal with the health issues as well as deal with the development issues, economic development issues, uh, is limited. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, many, many uh, countries in the developing world are commodity exporters. And of course, that is going to be hit very, very hard. In India, we are very fortunate. We are a commodity importer. Uh, so we'll benefit in terms of lower oil prices, lower commodity prices. But that's not true for the majority of countries in the developing world. Uh, so because of their limited fiscal resources, because the health infrastructure is so much worse, and because their exports are going to get hit, their ability to recover from this shock uh, is is going to be uh, much more much more constrained compared to the developed world. Now, there's one positive side to this, which is that uh, uh, immune systems, uh, you know, potentially the BCG uh, vaccine, these may confer uh, to the developing world, and of course, it has a younger population as well. These factors may mean that even though the uh, coronavirus spreads uh, much more exponentially among uh, our populations. 
that we are able to withstand it better with lower hospitalization and mortality rates. So that may be the offset to some of this. But nonetheless, when you put it all together, Rob, uh, it does appear to me that uh, while the developed world will will suffer you know, significant economic contraction, its recovery will be relatively quick uh, and they'll be able to power their way through it. Uh, the developing world, on the other hand, is going to find it quite difficult uh, to get through this. Yeah, I've been reading uh, quite a bit. Our uh, Commission on Global Economic Transformation is uh, developing uh, a report, and I've got a number of staff members working on on the continent of Africa. And the mention of the word trust, Fukuyama's book being a, a, a very nice illustration of what is at stake there. What we see in Africa throughout the continent is that the average age of people in governance is well over 60, and the average age of the population is about 28, which is quite a, a, a divide, and that the younger people have no faith or trust that the governance is going to be directed to creating a prosperous future for them. In Africa, the working age population over the next 40 years will go from about 1.2 to 2.6 billion people. But when the pandemic emerged, the number of officials at multilateral banks, intelligence agencies, and others that I have conversation with, they, they are afraid of chaotic and widespread social unrest and that the resources and the trust are not at all adequate to meeting this challenge. Let, let me shift to Gaurav. Uh, let's zoom in on India. How do you see India responding and, and what more would you suggest the country do? And please uh, share with me from the standpoint of a businessman it feels like we're all in this together, all hands on deck. What, what do you feel is the, uh, how would I call it, uh, the magic that the business community can contribute and invigorate everybody's uh, sense of comfort and sense that this is a transient phenomenon? Rob, the way I would look at it is there are various ways in which we can solve our social challenges in India today. So let's take a, one axis, which is Rawlsian versus utilitarian. You can move from Rawlsian, which is how do people at the bottom of the pyramid uh, benefit, to utilitarian, how does the average benefit. We can have another axis of authoritarian to libertarian. Um, and different countries made of respond in a different way. I think India has responded in a, on the spectrum as Rawlsian and somewhat authoritarian. And any solution that you find will get criticized, right? So India will have its own criticism, the US will have its own criticism, China might have its own criticism and so on and so forth. But given that it is, I think all of us need to come together to solve these problems. Uh, if you look at the migrant labor issue, that is one of the biggest problems that this transition is facing currently. Of course, there'll be economic issues that we will see as a result of this, but in the here and now, the migrant labor issues are, are a big problem. We've contributed towards a feeding program. I know other business people who have contributed towards health and feeding programs for migrant labor. Uh, and I think we need to do more of that. Uh, in terms of businesses, I think we need to be prepared for helping the SME community. So I think small businesses have a lot of problems and challenges of short-term finance and so on and so forth. And it is not only the banks who can solve these problems because many of these may or may not be bankable. They raise money from friends and family and informal sources. And typically it is their ultimate customers which are bigger businesses who need to support them with short-term cash flow infusion and so on and so forth. And that will help. I think in terms of uh, uh, the recovery, uh, we should also prepare for a recovery. And I think 
lessons from China are very uh, indicative. So if you look at just some China statistics, uh, uh, oil consumption fell down by almost 25% in China. It's now down by only about 5%, I believe. So we need to prepare that we will have a bounce back, whether it is three months from now, six months from now, and we will like China, but that will happen. If you just look at some of the Google Maps data, uh, peak traffic congestion in China in major cities is returning to normal. Off-peak is not yet returning to normal. So we need as businesses to prepare for that kind of uh, demand coming back. Uh, ch the Chinese recovery is being uh, led by construction and infrastructure. Now that may be something to do with the Chinese stimulus package. But I believe similar stuff is happening in Spain. So again, we need to be prepared as businesses to respond to that kind of demand pickup as it happens, uh, whether it is in construction or it's in other sectors. Uh, on the whole, I believe business need not be a passive partner. It needs to be a more active partner as we go out, get out of this current crisis. Jayant, do you uh, do you see things in India that are really, uh, which you might call innovative in relation to what's happening in other places in the world? That's a great question, Rob. And uh, I would say uh, yes in a limited way. Uh, I think in terms of uh, science and technology, innovation with respect to, uh, you know, new testing uh, kits or, uh, new drugs, vaccines. I think there we have limited innovation. We could do much more. Uh, we have come up with some new testing approaches and so on. But as far as drugs are concerned, as far as the vaccine is concerned, uh, we are uh, definitely following what the US and the UK and others are doing. So we really haven't innovated as much as we need to as far as science and technology is concerned. On the other hand, when it comes to managing the lockdown and coming up with administrative uh, approaches and innovations uh, to uh, keeping 1.35 billion people uh, pretty much at home uh, for now, uh, you know, close to 35, 40 days. Uh, I think we've done that remarkably well. Uh, and there has always been this criticism of India that, you know, we have weak state capacity. Uh, but I think what we are demonstrating through this very tight lockdown that we are following right now, which is perhaps the tightest lockdown in the world and still maintaining uh, social peace and harmony uh, and maintaining food supplies and other essential supplies to our people uh, is that we actually do have extraordinary state capacity, particularly when it's operated uh, in mission mode. So the way in which we have handled uh, these challenges uh, of maintaining this tight lockdown and at the same time uh, getting this unprecedented uh, social uh, sort of uh, cooperation uh, and Gaurav alluded earlier to uh, the whole concept of trust. Uh, I think the trust that people have right now uh, in the national leadership, uh, in what we are doing in terms of uh, supporting them through this very difficult time, I think uh, that is you know, very innovative and certainly, I think, unprecedented uh, when you look across the world. And that's reflected uh, in the ratings uh, that uh, you know, the Honorable Prime Minister, for example, has right now. Uh, one survey had him at 93.5%. Uh, uh, so I think in that sense, there has been real innovation in terms of managing a very, very tight lockdown uh, and enabling uh, trust uh, among all sections of society. Gaurav, uh, you've shared with me uh, recent writings about the, the relationship between what I call religion or different philosophies from all around the world and uh, how this might be, uh, how would I say, a, a very important time to regenerate the vision of what a business is, or what a business is for, or what constitutes success. As you see the private sector, how would I put it, compelled by the pandemic, not to just focus on shareholder maximization, 
but with the power, with the capacity, with the talent, with the systems to contribute to the whole world. How does that intersect with your philosophical deliberations? Uh, you know, let me start by saying, you know, there's a book by Chris Anderson and David Sally. It's called The Numbers Game. And I'll take you to soccer because this is a book on soccer, not really on religion. And they compare basketball and soccer. And they say that in basketball, you can play a strongman game, which means if you have one strong player or you bet on your strong players, you can win a basketball game. Soccer, because it's a larger field, a more po complex game, one person cannot dominate the court or the football or the soccer field. And therefore you need a, to sort out your weak links. So from a philosophical approach, society is much more complex than a basketball court, just like soccer is much more co co uh, complex than a basketball court. And therefore we need to invest all our energy, not just in the strong links, which is what we sometimes attempted to do, but towards the weak links. So I would say that would be uh, one of the uh, uh, things that I would uh, uh, take away. Secondly, I would say that life in many ways is self-fulfilling. If we believe we will succeed, we will innovate and we will succeed. So for example, I believe the bicycle was invented because there was a volcano eruption in the 1800s in Indonesia which led to ash formation and cooling of global temperatures. And therefore the harvest of oats was very low. As a result, horses couldn't be fed. And that led to the invention of the bicycle in Germany. And obviously the French named it bicycle after that. So we have to be able to bet on things like that, that human ingenuity and uh, will we'll actually win if we believe we can win. I'm uh, as I listen to you talking about uh, soccer versus basketball. I'm reminded of a podcast in the series by Malcolm Gladwell a couple of years ago. Uh, I think the series is called Revisionist History, and he was talking about how in the realm of education, people sometimes do the wrong thing for creating an education system. They tend to go where the donor gets validated. But he brought up the game of soccer, and he said, if you go hire a superstar for $50 million like Beckham, it creates a celebrity energy. But if you use that $50 million to improve the quality of players number 6 through 11, you win championships. And it was fascinating to hear you talking about soccer and the different the nature of the game rather than the one superstar, the interactive teamwork. And uh, I'll have to put that on the uh, on the website associated with this podcast because I thought I thought Malcolm Gladwell he he did three series or excuse me three episodes that were about how to construct an education system and use that as an analogy. Uh, Giant, as you're looking around the world, what what good examples and bad examples do you see in countries outside of India that you would you would like to underscore and illuminate? Well, we certainly need to understand exactly how, in another you know very large, densely populated country, which is China, uh, that they have been able to get back to normalcy. Uh, and uh, obviously, they locked down uh, Hubei province uh, very tightly. But, you know, we've done the same thing. Uh, and they've been able to uh, get to a point where they don't have any domestic infections anymore. Uh, whatever infections are coming are coming from outside the country. So clearly, they have been successful uh, at, a, at an unprecedented scale. Uh, certainly, Australia has been successful as well. I'm told that uh, new infections there have also uh, pretty much uh, uh, stopped. Uh, certainly, Korea has uh, done remarkably well. Germany has done remarkably well. Uh, so uh, whether you look at uh, democratic countries or non-democratic countries, you look at uh, tropical countries or temperate countries, there are good examples uh, uh, and good uh, strategies that people have followed that we can, we can certainly learn from. And Gaurav, you're, what do you see 
you have lots of, uh, how do you say, international experience. And so what are you seeing, particularly in the private sector around the world? Where are people rising to the challenge that you would find inspiring? Well, I think similar stuff than what we are seeing in India, really, Rob. I think businesses okay. are holding hands together to solve a lot of problems. Uh, businesses are uh, uh, not sh shying away from uh, some of the challenges. I'll tell you a story in courage that I saw uh, in my own home a couple of days ago. So my wife has an apparel business. She employs about 2,000 people. And one of her themes in her business is uh, women empowerment. And that's one of her missions. And Ann Taylor, which is an American company, supports her in this because she employs uh, uh, women workers. And one of her factories is an all-women factory. And she's had to retrench a lot of people. And together with Ann Taylor, she's been working to see how they do minimal retrenchments. And she wrote a very emotional letter, which she wrote in English and thereafter was translated into Hindi. Uh, she wrote a very emotional letter to her staff saying why they need to retrench some people. And even though it was in the end a negative exercise, it came out positive. The alternative strategy would have been denial. And that denial would, has, would have led to, led to bigger problems later on. And I think the fact that some of our customers, my wife's company, uh, the staff in the labor, they came together to be able to solve this problem, I thought was very, very uh, positive. The uh, question that many people are asking all around the world is how will the what you might call needed response to the pandemic affect our momentum in addressing the concerns of climate change? Many scientists believe that we're on a relatively short time horizon, meaning 10 to 15 years, to make profound transformation in our consumption of energy and particularly in the production of energy to move away from fossil fuels. There is a feeling like, as people use the phrase, a Green New Deal, that there's a need for a very large and global, uh, which you might call initiative and persistent initiative, a very, very profound transformation of the structure of production. So as the pandemic moves in, it uses a great deal of fiscal capacity. People are disrupted, probably fatigued, sometimes disoriented in relation to their employment. And people point to that and they say, this may retard or set back the, what was a building momentum and energy to deal with climate. But on the other side, people are saying what was unmasked by the pandemic may open, remove some of the blockages and open the system to more vital and coordinated and global response to climate change. I'll start, Gorov. how do you see the challenge of climate change in light of the arrival of the pandemic? Rob, well, you know, every horror movie you see starts with a scientist's advice being ignored. So the climate change horror movie is very similar. In the near term, though, as a result of this pandemic, I think we may move away from the concerns of climate change because our priorities would be slightly different. But in the long term, I actually believe we'll come back towards climate change. So let's look at what might happen in the near term. From a consumer behavior standpoint, from a behavior of certain governments and so on, uh, oil is cheap and therefore the trade-offs change. Secondly, because China is a major manufacturer of solar panels, of lithium ion batteries, and the trade, uh, uh, and the trade clampdown that is happening between US and China, 
the supply chain constraints that may emerge in China because of the pandemic may mean there may be delays and there may be challenges in environmental related uh, clean energy type of projects. And the Eurasia group actually, I think, has done a good study on what may happen to climate change uh, issues as a result of this pandemic. In the longer term, though, I believe if you look at the trade-offs of the major oil companies, with low oil, a lot of the oil investments, they will rethink. And they may actually divert investments towards clean energy. And therefore, I think it will pick up quickly the whole issue of climate change and so on and so forth. And Janet, I sent you this cartoon um, a couple of days ago, which is I took from Economist magazine, which showed the world fighting with a COVID-19 virus in a boxing ring. And outside the boxing ring, the big gorilla, which is climate change, is standing waiting for the next fight. So I think we will learn lessons from a fight with COVID-19, which we may use effectively for a fight with uh, cl uh, climate change. No, you're exactly right. Sure. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. We will learn lessons from uh, the fight with uh, uh, the coronavirus. Sadly, uh, I must say that those lessons don't inspire much confidence. Uh, because as I said right at the outset, um, uh, we have not been either able to understand the magnitude of these kinds of black swan events very well, grapple with it as a global society, nor once it is upon us, have we been able to co work on it in a coordinated fashion and deal with it with the appropriate multilateral institutions. Uh, now, that is the situation with uh, the coronavirus, which has a very finite end and which is very tractable uh, when it comes to medical science. Now, we know as far as climate change is concerned that it is in some ways even more catastrophic and even more open-ended. And because of the kind of... Uh, system our, our climate uh, is uh, that there are these open feedback loops that can result in uh, you know various different aspects of that subsystems whether it's the arctic or the antarctic ice uh, whether it's ocean warming whether it's precipitation whether it's drought many of these are subsystems that have these open catastrophic uh, sort of uh, exponential behaviors uh, that will be almost impossible uh, to manage and handle uh, and uh, you know, as a society, we just simply don't deal with non-linearity very well. Uh, our institutions move far too slowly. There's too many uh, vested interests that want to block it at every step of the way. Uh, but once these systems start to spiral out of control, uh, it becomes very, very difficult for us to deal with them. Uh, and that gives me, gives me great concern. And uh, I really do worry about it. Uh, and you're exactly right, Gaurav, that... Uh, uh, economist cartoon had climate change waiting for us, uh, but I'm not sure that that is a rendezvous I, uh, I am looking forward to. Let's uh, move to what, how would I say, is the centerpiece of INET's uh, mission. Gaurav, you're a member of our board and quite familiar with the agenda. But there is a notion that's referred to as the Overton window. It is that subset of what you might call the ideas that imagination could envision that are acceptable, that are part of the conventional wisdom. And it has been the case throughout history that periodically some disruption to the nature of commerce or the structure of the world or, or related to disease have been uh, past pandemics and or, or technological change, like we've seen the uh, massive transformation of the structure of production. As we look at these challenges, I would, I'm curious what each of you see as a likely change in the structure of ideas. And the way I, I would ask the question is, when a young person is in college 20 years from now, how are they going to think differently than someone who's been in college these last four years about the design and the structure of the world that we should have? Gorov, why don't you, why don't you, we'll start with you. You know, in some ways, I think, Rob, we've become more democratized. We've 
learned about each other's problems a little bit more. So for example, every 15 seconds, a child dies of malnutrition. So this is from a 2013 study uh, conducted uh, uh, globally called Make Poverty History. Now this used to be far away for most Western observers. It was not vivid. And all this was going on when there was enough food for everyone, as Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate, has pointed out. I think our day-to-day -day problems, we will be able to see more, uh, much better because of this crisis, I think. Second thing I believe is we will believe more in governments. Governments will come out, I think, on average, better. The cynicism that people have about governments, I think, will change. South Korea, as we know, has just run a full election in the middle of this crisis. So I think that kind of thing uh, I, I'm very optimistic about. Third, I think concepts that were on the fringe. So let's look at universal basic income. This was a fringe concept, although it started, I think, as a concept in the 16th century. It only came to our attention in any serious manner in the last 10 years. I think this will go far more mainstream in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, I think work from home as a concept may become more common to a university graduate graduating 20 years from now than someone graduating today. So Germany, as you may have seen, Rob, is passing a legislation where employees might get a right to work from home. Uh, just today, TCS, which is a $22 billion revenue company, announced that they have 450,000 people. And by 2025, they will go through a plan to see how a majority of them can work from home. So I think things like that will really change the way we conceive. The last point I want to make, and I'm a vegetarian, and I think it was Steven Pinker who gave a talk in Davos several years ago. And he said, we might think of eating meat uh, two generations from now, and each generation being defined as 15 years, so let's say in 30 years, the way we think of slavery today. So I would encourage people to watch this film. Rob, you should see it. Jayanth, you should see it. It's on Netflix called The Game Changers. It's on veganism, and it talks about not just the health issues, but the economic issues and the moral issues related to eating meat. So I think these may be the profound changes uh, that may happen in the next 25 years. Chayant, how would you uh, augment what Gaurav has uh, expressed? Those are very insightful uh, comments, Rob. Uh, and what I will add to that is that uh, we all have a incredible responsibility uh, to shift the Overton window uh, over to the point where, uh, you know, climate change becomes a very high priority for governments everywhere. Uh, and, you know, it will become obviously a priority for governments if it's a priority for people. Uh, and uh, we really have to thank uh, Greta Thunberg, for example, uh, in Europe for having, you know, in some ways single-handedly shifting the Overton window uh, on climate change, certainly in Europe, where, uh, you know, now it's become a very high priority. Uh, that's not the case in clearly the United States. It's clearly not the case uh, in India. Uh, I, I wouldn't know much about how China is looking at it. Certainly, we know uh, Australia is grappling with this. Uh, but it really is uh, very incumbent upon us uh, to build the environment, to build uh, the thinking and the commitment uh, among people uh, to make this a front and center high priority issue. Uh, because governments obviously uh, react to uh, what uh, what people require. Uh, and one of the things I do worry about uh, is that if you take air pollution in New Delhi as an example, we are living here in Delhi in the most polluted city in the world. Uh, pollution levels are high throughout the year. But for three or four months of the year, in the fall and uh, in, in the winter, uh, it's almost unbearable. I mean, you simply can't breathe the poisonous air. However... 
And this is really what concerns me, Rob. However, it's not an election issue. And so how do we, how do we ensure uh, that people are able to lift themselves up uh, from the very, very sort of uh, here and now, very sort of uh, narrow issues that most of them grapple with and deal with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and really help them think longer term uh, and more systemically about the world they are going to live in and their children are going to live in. Uh, because uh, particularly, you know, since I'm uh, somebody who is uh, an elected uh, member of parliament, I sit in our lower house, I have uh, 1.7 million voters uh, in my constituency, about two and a half million people I represent. Uh, you know, uh, when I talk to them, uh, most of their interests, most of the issues that really concern them uh, are very, very uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, nearer term. They're not longer term at all. And they are uh, very much uh, concerned about uh, how their lives are going to be tomorrow and the day after. But very few of them really think deeply about, uh, you know, what their lives are going to be like five or 10 years from now, what their children's lives are going to be like. Uh, but again, as far as climate change is concerned, we've obviously got to act now for uh, being able to deal with the catastrophic consequences 10 years from now. So how do you build that public uh, understanding uh, and how do you get people motivated uh, to place pressure on their elected representatives to act on these issues uh, is something uh, I'm not sure that we have achieved, certainly not in India. In the, in the same, uh, how do I say, spirit related to the Overton window, ever since the Treaty of Westphalia, social designers and social you know, analysts of social policy have focused on something they call the nation state. In recent years, with technological development, technological and financial capital mobility, greater human mobility through transportation, which you might call the, the integrity or clarity of what is called a nation state, has been drawn into question. People refer to the advent of globalization. And I sense as the pandemic traveled across borders that people were seeing a bit of a contradiction to the economist worldview that fewer restrictions and more flexibility means things can be redeployed and everything can reach its comparative advantage and be better. An epidemiologist might say, well, when things are good, they can diffuse through that unrestrained network. But when things are bad, they need to be confined, that there needs to be compartmentalization to stop the propagation of the bad. So in this world of what we might call porous nations embedded in the globalist environment, how will the pandemic and climate affect our perception of the structure of, glo of globalization in relation to the nation state. Does the nation state have to be fortified or do we need global governance, particularly on issues like climate? I'm curious how e each of you sees the future of globalization. Jayant, why don't we uh, reverse the roles and start with you first on this one. Globalization uh, is certainly uh, going to uh continue to be a very, very important aspect uh, of all uh, nation states. And uh, we are going to have to uh, find ways of making it work better for everyone. And there are many different sort of uh, areas where uh, uh, there is very significant friction that is developing in the globalization paradigm uh, that we have been following. There will have to be adjustments. I mean, one very obvious thing is that if you look at... Uh, how multilateral institutions are set up, whether it's the UN or the IMF. Uh, in many cases, countries like India are uh, deeply underrepresented and they are uh, by no means uh, you know, uh, a fair and uh, uh, balanced uh, representation of either people or economic uh, uh, stature or any other consideration. So multilateral institutions are going to have to be reformed root and branch. That's one very important aspect of globalization. 
Uh, second, uh, multilateral institutions will also uh, have to play a much more vigilant role uh, in dealing with some of these challenges associated with globalization, as Gaurav was pointing out. The obvious example here, of course, is WHO uh, and its role relative to the pandemic. Uh, so we have to not only reform the institutions, you have to make sure that they work far, far better. Then there are very serious issues around global equity, Rob. Uh, certainly when it comes to climate change, for example, and you look at it in terms of the stock of emissions uh, that a developed world citizen has put up there and you know previous generations have put up there into the atmosphere, and you look at what any Indian citizen is going to do, uh, if you look at it not just from a flow perspective, which is, tr- which is traditionally the way the dialogue has happened, but look at it from a stock perspective, uh, it's obvious that uh, there are massive, massive inequities uh, associated with, uh, with climate change. Then there are really serious issues about capital and uh, human flows. Migration, of course, uh, is is a major concern for Europe right now, uh, certainly for India in terms of our people, our diaspora, etc. So each of these, as I said, is is a major, you know, sort of area of friction for globalization. But unless we develop strong and capable multilateral institutions uh, and we agree uh, that uh, we will support them, uh, we really are not going to be able to make globalization work for us right now. Uh, you know, it is it is uh, something we can't uh, we can't wish away. Uh, but frankly, I don't think it's working very well for us right now. Gaurav, your thoughts? So, Rob, the way I am looking at globalization is simply classical. Look at it in terms of trade flows, capital flows, and flow of people. So. If you look at trade as percentage of GDP, that's already peaked and it's slowing down a little bit. I do believe it's a bit of a pendulum and it will shift back into high gear. I think the big problem may be in terms of short-term nationalistic interests. So for example, in India right now, uh, there are these WhatsApp messages going within all of us uh, in the business community and, and consumers in general saying, please buy your product from Tata Click, which is an Indian owned e-commerce site and don't buy it from Amazon or Flipkart. Flipkart, by the way, is owned by Walmart. So there's this kind of sentiment uh, saying, we need to save India, we need to do work for India, we are in a pandemic. And it's inevitable that these kinds of sentiments will surface. And I think over time they will dissipate. I think a longer term problem has to do with inequality leading to pressures on people moving and migration. And I think this may be a bigger problem for Europe um, uh, than for some other countries, uh, some other uh, continents. But I think the big challenge to globalization will be just migration of people and how it will work. Uh, So I worry about that. I don't really have uh, an answer. And part of globalization today is also interlinked with the power shift between the Western world and China. And I think that superimposes a whole new set of challenges that may curtail globalization from time to time. So if you just look at what's happened in the last few weeks, China has become more aggressive in the South China Sea. China has uh, become, is getting a little bit more aggressive again in Hong Kong last couple of days. And how that all will play out uh, remains to be seen. And by the way, I'll give it back to Jan because Jan actually wrote a very good op-ed a couple of days ago in the Economic Times in India. And he called this word gated globalism. So I think this word gated globalization will become uh, a terminology in the world of economics. John, your thoughts there? Uh, and, and I'll try to get a copy to post on the website also uh, of your new op-ed. Thank you, uh, Rob. Gaurav uh, is right uh, to have said that, uh, you know, we are... Uh, uh, going to be using trust uh, very much as a uh, way to think about the future. Uh, and when you apply the idea of trust to globalization, you very naturally come to uh, this concept of gated globalization, because uh, just like you know, you have a gated community where uh, there are people within the community that you trust, uh, we are going to create these gated sort of communities within which uh, we will trade uh, you know, in, a, in a free way. Uh, but outside our gated communities, we will have real distrust uh, with our trading partners. And uh, the question, of course, is how will these gated communities get created? 
Uh, obviously, there are a variety of free trade agreements that already exist. People are fashioning new free trade agreements. But increasingly, we will see those kinds of bilateral arrangements as opposed to the classic multilateral arrangements of the past. Again, because as I was saying earlier, uh, that uh, the multilateral institutions have really in some ways uh, not uh, succeeded. Uh, and you may be familiar with what uh, the present uh, Trump administration is doing with the WTO, for example, uh, where they have rendered that uh, multilateral institution largely defunct uh, and uh, you know started to do a series of bilateral negotiations on the trade side. So in effect, you know, the Trump administration is creating kind of a gated globalization, uh, even as we speak. And certainly, uh, since uh, the U.S. sets the rules in many of these situations, uh, we in India will have to follow. Uh, there has been some action recently for us as well on foreign direct investment, uh, where again, in the same idea of gated globalization, uh, we have said that uh, our FDI policies are uh, what they are for the rest of the world, but any country that shares a geographic border with India uh, will have to go through a, a special set of checks uh, when it comes to uh, foreign direct investment. So in effect, we are already in the process, uh, as we speak, of creating these gated communities and deciding whom is it that we trust and, and how we want to do uh, trade with them. Uh, and another good example, of course, is uh, the pressure uh, on the UK and uh, other countries in Europe around 5G. Uh, that the Trump administration uh, is imposing. Uh, so we see these, we see these happening uh, across uh, uh, across the world, and increasingly post the pandemic, uh, where you never know who's coming on a plane and what impact that's going to have on you. Uh, we may even see health uh, and health certificates uh, as a way of genuinely setting up these kinds of gates. Gorov, do you have uh, final thoughts you'd like to share with our, our listeners? So I was saying, I think in a crisis like this, heroes reveal themselves. I've been reading a book called 100 Great Lives. It's uh, edited by a person called John Canning. And it follows, covers the lives of Charles Darwin, Abraham Lincoln, Otto von Bismarck, and so on and so forth. And it's very clear when you read these biographies that these leaders emerged from some kind of crisis or another. Charles Darwin's battle against the religious establishment was just intense. You know, Abraham Lincoln's during the war, Civil War and so on and so forth. So I do believe uh, crises are an opportunity for leadership uh, to emerge. And the last point I want to make is I was hearing this song actually a couple of days ago by Barbara Streisand. And it's called Don't Lie to Me. It's a message to Trump, by the way. And one sure, sure. out of that song really struck me. It says, everyone answers to someone. So when we are in positions of power and influence, we kind of forget. And times like this, we realize we all answer to someone. Very nice. Chayant, final thoughts? Very difficult for me to add anything more uh, more than what Gaurav has already uh, laid out. But uh, he's exactly right. Uh, the moment will find uh, the woman. And uh, we will uh, certainly have people stepping forward and, uh, and providing us their sterling leadership, uh, which uh, the world really requires just now. And, uh, uh, you know, we do have a number of challenges. Uh, I mean, Obviously, we've discussed quite a few of them. Uh, but again, the human spirit, uh, human innovation uh, is, is the force that has propelled us uh, through history. Uh, and that is undaunted, undiminished. Uh, and certainly even through this pandemic, we are seeing uh, how, how uh, people have rallied behind uh, uh, their leaders. They've rallied to ensure that uh, fellow human beings are being supported. Uh, so uh, the human spirit will certainly carry us through. Thank you both. I'm uh, actually, I, this is an audio broadcast, but I'm smiling at the moment because I'm uh, remembering the good fortune that I had several years ago to be caught on a bus in a snowstorm from Zurich headed toward Davos. And sitting across from me was a gentleman, and we struck up a nice conversation and 
how you say, made the best of five to six hours on a bus in a ride that usually is about 90 minutes long. And that was you, Goroff. And little did I know as I was watching the snowstorm and trying to use my phone in weak Wi-Fi territory to reschedule some meetings, that I'd have the good fortune of talking with you and working with you and meeting Jayant here on this telecast. The uh, clarity and the intelligence you both bring to bear is quite encouraging. And I want to read a poem that someone shared with me yesterday uh, that I think it was written about nine years ago, but I think it's quite germane to the conversation we had and to the current challenge. The name of the poem is, it is, is Infect the World with Your Light. It's by a man named Ben Okri, who's from Africa, and it goes like this. Will you be at the harvest among the gatherers of new fruits? Then you must begin today to remake your mental and spiritual world and join the warriors and celebrants of freedom, realizers of great dreams. You can't remake the world without remaking yourself. Each new era begins within. It is an inward event with unsuspected possibilities for inner liberation. We could use it to turn on our inward lights. We could use it to use even the dark and negative things positively. We could use the new era to clean our eyes, to see the world differently, and to see ourselves more clearly. Only free people can make a free world. Infect the world with your light. Help fulfill the golden prophecies. Press forward the human genius. Our future is greater than our past. Once again, thank you both for joining me today. I hope that we can convene again for another chapter on this podcast in a few months' time and reflect on where things are at that point. But this was quite illuminating today. And uh, thank you for sharing your light. Thank you, Rob. And uh, that was a beautiful play poem. And I'll just conclude by saying that uh, it reminds me of Mahatma Gandhiji's immortal words, be the change you want to see. <laughs> yeah. On yeah. that note, Rob, thank you once again. Thank you. Well, uh, to be continued. Bye-bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.